notion. Um, glad to be here today. We're broadca I'm broadcasting from Annapolis, Maryland, where I'm serving as a record pres preservation specialist for Family Search in the Maryland State Archives. So this is uh, why we might have a little bit of back and forth difficulty with this broadcasting from all the way across the country. Um, we're going to be talking about using multiple online genealogy programs uh, <clears throat> to find your ancestors. And basically, most of the people that I know and that I work with as researchers, um, except for those very experienced researchers that I associate with on occasion, um, use only one or two websites. Um, they basically have, uh, if they do, have an online family tree. They have a family tree and they use that program, whether it's Ancestry or, or Family Search or Find My Past or My Heritage or whatever, to do their research. And then um, they may or may not uh, move out to some other programs. But I very commonly find people who are locked into one program and um, then they basically don't have any any other contact with other programs. Um, in fact, I get com comments commonly that say, oh, well, I thought that Family Search and Ancestry had all the same records or so forth. And that's uh, these are kind of impressions that are on out there. So I thought what would be a good idea would be to talk about having um, using more than one program and how I would do it. In this case, what I've done, um, I need to understand, first of all, I guess, that there are tens of thousands of genealogically valuable websites out there. Uh, there's just an unending stream. I spend a considerable amount of time uh, online looking for different websites and, and usually takes me two or three minutes to find a new one that I've never heard of and, and haven't ever used before that's uh, valuable. So it's it, there's just a, an almost un, uh, unending source a number of sources out there for finding information. Uh, so I'm I'm going to confine my discussion to uh, one or two uh, programs. Uh, rather rather do rather to time constraints and to keep it become, from becoming too confusing as to what I'm doing uh, when I jump back and forth. But uh, there are probably even more than than lots of. Programs. It's just a, an amazing number of things out there to look for. So what I'm going to try to do is show how to use these different programs at the same time to do research about an ancestor. Now there's a, a limitation here, and that is uh, if you're going to be using a multiple programs, uh, some of those may be subscription programs. You may have to have a subscription to more than one program. Uh, this can create uh, an expense, an overhead expense, um, for finding information about genealogy. Uh, that is a consideration, and uh, I do find that to be a concern uh, by many people that they're, uh, that it just is more expensive. Well, uh, my answer to that is always compared to what, and um, uh, I normally live in Utah, and uh, one of the things that's very common in Utah are things like ATVs and boats and uh, uh, all sorts of uh, off-road vehicles, and uh, most of those cost uh, 10 to 100 times more than the cost of doing genealogy. So uh, sometimes I'm not really that sympathetic to the, the idea. Genealogy is probably one of the least expensive um, uh, activities that you can participate in. Um, so let's get started here. I will choose, and I have chosen, a relative from uh, the Family Search family tree. And uh, of course, I, uh, since I'm going to show how I did the research for this, it would be a relative that I was re uh, currently researching. So I show over there on the screen how I'm related going back uh, a few generations. And I chose someone in this for this uh, particular uh, presentation that, that was quite difficult. This is a, a difficult question. This one was not somebody who just was real easy that I just searched uh, for a 
British Census Register or whatever. These people were in all, all of these ancestors back, uh, starting back about four generations, were um, uh, from England. So these are all English ancestors. Um, here's the person I chose. His name was William Tarbett. And uh, this is exactly the amount of information I had about him when I began uh, my research. This was all that was in uh, family search. Uh, there was no uh, spouse. There were no children. Uh, this person simply uh, had a christening date of 13 May 1814 and a place where he was christened uh, called Cranbrook in Kent, England. And so there was a lot of things. He was also... Um, the first thing I did find was that he was christened as a nonconformist. In England, a uh, classification of nonconformist meant that he was a member of a church other than the official Church of England. And uh, this, this is a little bit more challenging. Uh, there are quite a few nonconformist records available in England, but they're not nearly as, as um, uniform. Obviously, uh, one of the one, there's a different whole different set of records in England that we would be looking at, and that's the government records, the the official government records such as the census records, and the, and um, in later years um, the civil registration records. So, but William Tarbett is uh, dates back before civil registration in England, and so we we're, there are some questions about it. So this is the uh, this is the record that I found on Family Search just by clicking on the link to do a search through Family Search, given the information I had from him, and it said that he was baptized uh, into the uh, into his nonconformist. This is nonconformist record. He was baptized as uh, into the church that he belonged to, or his parents belonged to, and. Uh, in 1814 and, and gave me the name of his mother and father and this helped me to uh, identify to see whether or not he was uh, a member of this particular family that I have that I was researching. And I was doing descendancy research in other words I started with John Tarbett and Sarah Tarbett his wife and I was picking up their children and so this is one of the children in the John and Sarah Tarbett family. Uh, there were no sources attached to him, but I would suggest that if there are any sources before you start doing any research, that you uh, carefully read and review any and all sources and memories or anything else that's attached to that individual in any of the programs. Um, if you are doing initial research and you have nothing on this person and you've just, uh, just discovered uh, a new name or are you suppose that you're starting to research about a family like I was doing here looking for the children of a uh, of an of a cousin and uh, doing descendancy research that uh, there may not be any sources or memories but if there happen to be uh, those sources and memories attached should be looking at all those before you start doing any uh, adding anything doing any more research um, you may find that the sources and the memories uh, may not be accurate. They may not be the right people. Uh, there are, uh, you know, a lot of instances. And this, un this particular presentation is going to show an example of how that can possibly happen. Uh, if there are no sources, uh, then we have to assume that the person and the information in a family tree may not be correct. Uh, any any family tree of any of the programs, online family tree programs, if you find a name and there's no associated source, no record that supports the information that is contained in the family tree, whether it's Family Search Family Tree or Ancestry or one of the other programs, then, then I have to assume and I would encourage people to assume that that information is not correct. Uh, you have to, You cannot simply accept an information because someone entered it into a family tree. It doesn't work that way. Um, okay, so first, there's some basic things that we need to do with any entry in any program, and particularly in family search, and that is we need to check for duplicates in the program. Um, there are uh, possibilities that other people uh, 
have entered the names uh, more than one time. Uh, this is particularly true in a shared family tree, but I've found duplicates in my own trees on ancestry and on my heritage uh, because I uh, began my uh, those those uh, particular family trees by uploading a GEDCOM from uh, from my records and didn't realize I had duplicates. So uh, if the program, which it probably would, and in this case Family Search does allow you to search for duplicates, as do um, the other programs, then basically you need to search for those duplicates in order to determine what's going on. Uh, secondly, it's a good idea to standardize dates and places. Uh, the standardization of the, of the names and dates in Family Search is uh, is just been changed. The way it works has just been changed in the last week or so. Uh, it may be a little bit uh, different than you're used to, but the idea here is to provide uh, a uh, standardized way of referring to dates and places so that uh, the information can be shared. Uh, accurately, and also that the computer programs can um, accurately find these record hints that they're they're producing, and in, in many of the, in the, some of these programs. So what we have here is uh, then we proceed to search for additional records. So we need to start actually doing some research. It's pretty hard to do. There's a sort of a chicken and the egg problem here, where uh, you don't have enough information to really search for the person. Uh, but you have uh, but you have to use what you have uh, to to try to make some headway in finding that person. So I guess I'll continue to discuss that as we go along, so that you can see how it is that you sort of bootstrap your way into looking for a person. So here's the family as it appeared. Um, we had uh, a whole group of people. Uh, the children listed with this um, with this family, uh, John Tarbett and Sarah Curl, and then uh, each of the children and William Tarbett uh, is the last one in the line down there, and he was supposedly uh, born in 1814, um, and there's birth dates for all the other children. So where did this Happen well. First of all, we have to look at this and make sure that all of this information matches. And the the point that we're going to emphasize over and over again, I'm going to emphasize over and over again, is uh, to look at the location. That uh, dates and names hmm, can be approximate. Uh, they may not be as completely accurate as they uh, are complete as they need to be. Uh, the spelling, uh, by the way, Tarbit is spelled three or four different ways. And so there's uh, there's always those kind of variations. But when we're talking about the place, we need to be very, very specific. And this becomes even, it, as you move back in time, this becomes more and more important. So what I'm going to check in each of these cases is I'm going to uh, start off by uh, checking each of the members of the family down, each children and the parents and each children, and see what the record says where they were born. Uh, that is a quick way to do it. And most of the programs you can simply click through and, and look and see where each of those people are recorded to have been born. Uh, the important thing in this point is to determine whether or not you have a family or you've got a few stray people that have the same name in there that really don't belong there because they live miles and miles away. It's also important at this point to focus in on the time period that these people uh, lived. In this case, 1797, 1799, or in the 1700s into the early 1800s. This is um, uh, before the uh, advent of railroads in England, and it is uh, in pre-industrialization. Uh, industrialization started a few years in, earlier in the 1700s, but the impact was not fed, felt strongly throughout the country until the mid-1800s. These are other things that are helpful to know as you begin your research and look at this to see if it's reasonable, if it makes sense. So we check each of the children individually to see if they fit within the family. And then if they don't, if you find outliers who are way, who uh, live many 
many miles away from where they're supposed to be living, then they raise instant questions as to whether A, they belong to the family, or B, how did the family, uh, how did the mother get there to have a baby uh, someplace other than they were they were all living. So this is the uh, a screen of the of a pretty much the general search on uh, William Tarbot's name uh, and the place where in England and the date, and you can see that there is a record uh, immediately because there's Cranbrook is where he was uh, supposed to be. There's a Cranbrook record right there that says he was christened on 13 May 1814. Um, so that means that we don't know when he was born. Uh, the question is, was he was he christened shortly after birth? Um, many people assume immediately that the that the christening date is the same as the birth date, and that's not the case. The mother did not leap out of the bed from having a baby and run down and have the the infant christened, unless there were really unusual circumstances, like they didn't expect the mother or the baby to live or something like that. But generally speaking, the christening date can be later, and in in some cases, it can be many much later than the time when the baby babies were born. So now we're going to search for additional records because this is this doesn't really help me. It doesn't tell me if he died, if he lived for a short period of time, or if he died, or if he lived long enough to get married and have children. Uh, don't know a whole lot about him, uh, and um, I can uh, I need to continue to do some research, especially since my interest at this point was to continue doing. Uh, descendancy research, so I'm looking to see if he got married, so if he had any children, so I can add another generation down of descendants of my ancestors. So we need to make sure that the dates and the places match. Now, now what does that mean? It means that uh, I need to know that uh, this place existed in the time that that person lived. I need to know that uh, that the place uh, that he could have been born in that place at all. Um, many times, I, I can't emphasize this so much, I, when I get into online family trees and begin to use what's there, I find uh, places that uh, did not exist at the time and the date, that, that the date of the, of the events that were supposed to have happened there. So we just need to be careful that there's the dates and the places match as we go along. So. Basically, after looking at the information that I do have, I, I need to have a record showing his marriage or his death or both. It would be nice to know how long he lived. Uh, there may or may not be a death record. There may or may not be a marriage record. But I need to know if that's possible, and then I need to search for that. But I did not find that uh, in this program. Now, some of this I'm going to have to to say that I did. Now, one of the things I did at this point, and always do, is I go out to a program called Find My, uh, Find My Past, uh, com, which is another online family tree program, but has a huge database of English records. And I use that program to see how many William Tarbots there were near Cranbrook in, um, in Kent in this particular, at this particular time. So I've got a date. And I've got a place, and I can then look and see how many are there. I can do that also in um, in Family Search, and I can do that in Ancestry or in uh, My Heritage by simply doing a search for William Tarbot at a date or a date range, and then a specific place. And if I make the place specific enough, then um, I can see how far, how many people there were in that pool of people named William Tarbot that I need to worry about to see if I have the right one. And uh, once I find a number of different people with the same name or, or different, uh, very, uh, different dates, places of the siblings, I always check to see how far they are apart. So I'll enter in Cranbrook, for example, into uh, Google Maps, and then I'll say uh, uh, directions to, and it will tell me how far away a place is that I am uh, that are listed as other places now. Uh, bearing in mind the um, the time period that we're talking about, early 1800s, late 1700s, 
uh, we have to think in terms of how fast the people could travel, how far they might travel. And so uh, if we find something that uh, is outside of the range, the normal range of, of where these people would have lived, which is sort of a ballpark figure is about 10 miles around the original place. Uh, some people go down to even six miles, but six to 10 miles around that place, then you begin to question if they are the same family, even if they do have the same name. Okay, so always remember the time period involved and always check to see uh, where these different places are. You can just uh, move around and, and uh, go from one place to the next and come up with the distances and see whether it's reasonable that that the family could have come from multiple different places if in fact that's what you're seeing on a family tree. And then I always look at the place to get a feel for what the rec for what records might be available. I want to know how old the town is, where it is, whether it's a brand new town, whether it's in a big city or in a small city, and I can use that and this is Cranbrook in uh, church in uh, in England, and I got this off of uh, Google Maps Street View. So I can actually drive around in the little community and see uh, what information there is. And I can see here that there's a cemetery, and uh, I can look and see if there's cemetery records. I can try to see if there's other kinds of records that might be suggested by my driving around in that community. And it tells me how large it is and how much, how possible it is that they were uh, that they did uh, live in this particular area. Uh, it makes a big difference if that person was in a large city like London or, or uh, Bristol or someplace instead of in a little tiny town like Cranbrook. Okay, so now it's time to look for some additional websites. I Basically, with the search I have on Family Search, because that's where I started, I have exhausted all of that information that I'm going to find. And so now I can go up to other records. Uh, Family Search has Family Search Partner programs, Ancestry Find My Past and My Heritage, and they, all, they also happen to be some of the largest online programs. But like I said at the beginning, there are literally uh, probably thousands and thousands of places to look for genealogical information. And there's a whole hierarchy of places to look in England. And many of the researchers who do research in England start with different places, start different places. They may start with the um, GRO, the Government Records Office, or they might start, start with the uh, uh, websites of the uh, parish clerks who are putting up uh, records online. Um, there's lots of different places where you could actually go to start to get your information if that's what you're doing. But it also depends, again, on the time period that you're looking for. So if, you're, if you have not used these programs previously, you may wish to go to a family history center uh, that is nearby. There are now over 5,000 of these worldwide. And try these for, for the uh, free versions of these programs that are available at family history centers. So all four of these programs, my uh, family search is a free program. It, there's no charge for it at all. The other three programs are subscription-based programs, but there are free versions that are available at the family history centers. So that's a way that you could go into a family history center and do the same thing uh, without subscribing to all these websites or uh, you may want to, uh, if you find that they become very useful, um, go ahead and subscribe. Um, so what we do is click on the links to start. Now what does that mean? It means that uh, I'm going to go out there and look in Ancestry and uh, use the information that I have or enter the information that I have from FamilySearch. Now, if I've already started with Ancestry, it's obviously going to be a little bit different because I may want to have to go over and put the information to search in Family Search. But now I'm going from uh, from the information I had in um, Family Search, and now I find that same England and Wales nonconformist and non-parochial record uh, with William Tarbot listed as a child, and. Uh, 
when I do that, um, those records and those records back, I'm going to back up here for a second. You'll see down there that there's uh, 1891, 1881 census showing William Tarbot born in 1811 in Cranbrook and is uh, still in Cranbrook and his wife's name is Sarah, Sarah Tarbot. And so uh, maybe we found our William uh, Tarbot. It would depend on how many William Tarbots there are in Cranbrook. Um, so basically when we got to the ones that, and and I began at this point, I have to admit that I began to uh, to focus in on uh, this William Tarbot who was married to Sarah to see if this was my person. It seems it did. But the problem shows uh, that uh, there was a birth date uh, of 1 December 1810. Okay, so the first record up there, William Tarbot, of my John Tarbot and his wife, as the father and mother, it says the baptism was in 1814, but he was born in 1810. Okay, so this brings up that question that I mentioned a moment ago, that these people did not rush out to the church to get their children baptized uh, immediately after birth. And in fact, um, I then I begin another tree uh, on ancestry. So I have my family tree on family search. I have my family tree on family tree. And so I use that as a basis for looking for the information about this person. So I attached that first record, the nonconformist record, to uh, to my person, William Tarbot, uh, on the uh, on the ancestry family tree. So now I have him in in uh, on my tree in Family Search. I have him on my tree in uh, Ancestry. And uh, as a matter of fact, I could, I could have put him, also worked with him in my family tree on Find My Past and my family tree on My Heritage. The advantage I'm getting with all of these four programs is that I'm getting record hints from all of them. So they're doing helping me do the work. Um, in this case, not getting so many record hints, but uh, in the one we're looking at here. But here's a bunch that came from Family Search. I mean, excuse me, from Ancestry. As soon as I entered uh, the information I had about William Tarbot, I got seven hints. And so I have civil registration and death. I have uh, that he died in uh, birth in 1815 and died in 1868. And another one, and he married somebody named Eliza. And oh dear, we're getting into some difficulties here because we have another William Tarbot who married somebody named Eliza and uh, was born in 1815 and was resident in, uh, in born in 1815 in Cranbrook. So it's starting to get a little bit complicated. Uh, I then have to start to make some decisions, but I'm going to go back and forth and see how I can resolve that. Uh, but when I look at these, none of these record Hence, seem to match my William Tarbot, Tarbot, because my William Tarbot was born in 1810, supposedly, and so I don't think that anybody here in these record hints is my person. But I do have a birth date now because I got a birth date out of the record on uh, on ancestry. So now I'm going to pop back to family search and put the birth date in. So now I know his exact birth date. So now I can look for somebody who was born in that year. And I have a birth in 1811 and I have another one in 1810. So now I'm still working on a uh, on people that are born in 1811 and 1810. But I noticed that all three of these 1811 people are census records. And the interesting thing about census records when you're doing research is that um, the census happens on a certain day in the year. And the question isn't necessarily what, when you were born, but how old are you? So it's your age. And then the, the birth date, birth year, is calculated from, in many cases, from the, um, the age. And so, depending on where your birthday is, if you're in, the, in coming before in the year before the census or after the census, 
then your birth year can, can vary by one year back and forth with census records, which is very common, a very common issue. So the fact that it says 1811 doesn't bother me. The fact that, that I have a whole bunch of, of, of records now for uh, someone named William Tarbot who was married to Sarah Tarbot, and, uh, and uh, I find a find a grave that says his birth was 1810, and uh, we have him dying in 1893 and things like that. All of these records seem to indicate that I'm making quite a, quite a bit of progress here in identifying this person because now I have a spouse and I have a, a, uh, a death date and I have a, a, a possible birth date. So I could possibly find a marriage date. It's, it uh, may or may not be recorded, but now that I have the name of a spouse, I can... Uh, uh, Sometimes that would be my next goal, would be to find a marriage record, and then we'd have the beginnings of, of having some records about this person. Okay, but still, if you think about it, there's still this problem out there that there was a christening date in 1814. Um, the, the question is, is the, is the William Tarbot, who was, who was christened in 1814 and born in 1810, the same as this William Tarbot, who's married to Sarah Tarbot, and dies in 1893. Uh, I guess uh, the question I would say is, when do you give up on this? In other words, you've done research, you've found some sources, uh, you you think they're reliable, the names, the dates, and places match, everybody seems happy, uh, it seems like we've, we've answered all the questions, and uh, aren't we through? And the answer is, no, you're not through. And so I checked Find My Past to see how many William Tarbots lived in Cranbrook, England. Now that I have a birth date, I can be more specific about this. Uh, before, I just had a general idea of how many William Tarbots there were in the area surrounding Cranbrook and in Cranbrook. But now I can focus in and see how many were there really in Cranbrook. So here's my search. I'm searching for William Tarbot, and I put in the year 1810 birth plus or minus two years. I say England, and I put in a location of Kent uh, as the county, and then I put Cranbrook, Kent, England, and I look, and I have only 15 results. That's great. You know, That puts me into a range of, uh, I certainly should be able to sort out who these people are by looking at, the, at, at 15 entries, because uh, that's not going to be enough for me to, to, be, to get really worried about. Okay, so here were the results, and I had uh, William Tarbot, born in 1811, and, and, uh, and then the 1871 census and the 1881 census. So the implication here is that this William Tarbot, who was born in 1811, lived until 71, 1871 and 1881. And as a matter of fact, 1891, because he's still in the 1891 census, and then he died in 1893, and there's nobody else listed. This is him. Okay, so there's this one guy in, Cr in Cranbrook who was born in 1810, 1811, and then died in 1893, and he's the same one that was married to Sarah. Okay, great. We've now used the programs to bring this all down and focused it in and, and found the guy that, that he lived. And he lived his whole life in, in Cranbrook, which makes life, you know, makes it a lot easier because he never left and we don't have to worry about chasing him all over the countryside. Okay, so what's next? Except there's another William Tarbot born in the same place in 1811. <laughs> really? How do we know this? Because I had the christening record. And the christening record said that he was born in 1810 or 1811, 1810, 1811, and he was christened in Cranbrook. Oh, wait a minute. Do we still know whether this is the same one that, um, I like Microsoft coming on and telling me that I have updates, um, there, uh, that we have the same person? The answer is, well, let's go look again. So now we have more records. We have more information about this individual. And the next time we search, by the way, I'm doing essentially the same search over and over again, but adding little pieces of information that I find each time I do the search, I'm adding a little bit more. So 
than I didn't have previously. And now guess what? I find the christening record. And it lists the, the birth dates. And guess what? This family of John and Sarah Tarbet had all of their children baptized on the same day, May 13th, 1814. And that William was born on December 1st, 1810. Okay, so now we have, not only have we separated out the fact of the, uh, the fact of the christening, by this is my second, third, or fourth time into ancestry, by the way, switching back and forth between family search, ancestry, find my past, and, and working through the programs. I could keep adding programs, but I'm trying to keep it sort of focused for this presentation. So next step is all the children were christened in the same day. So that explains the mystery of the christening date and why it doesn't correspond uh, very closely to the birth date, but it also raises another question. Okay, so I go into my heritage and I find a census record for him. And I, excuse me, I go in, yes, I go into my heritage and I find a census record for William Tarbot. And it, once again, it shows him in Cranbrook. This is the 18, uh, it says he was born about 1811. And this is his 1861, and it said he's a basket maker. Okay, so, and he employs one person. So his occupation is basket maker, and he's living in Cranbrook. And once again, he's married to Sarah Tarbot. And pretty much I, uh, and there's several other records here in my heritage that uh, help me get along here. And so now I put down that he was born on 1st December 1810 and he christened on 13 May 1814. And uh, I've added all that information in. And I look up and I find, guess what? His wife's name was Sarah Monk Smith. So now I not only have um, uh, the information about uh, another search and family search puts, uh, gives me a name, a uh, uh, maiden name, of the wife. So I'm, you know, moving along pretty well. And I find his wife in the England and Wales census records. And I also find uh, uh, information. And apparently, when we go through all the census records chronologically, 1841, 51, 61, 71, 81, 91, they did not have any children. So they never had any children. So here we have a, a kind of an end of line for a descendancy group, descendancy investigation, and we have identified um, our guy, uh, William Tarbot. He's in Cranbrook. We have uh, um, a, uh, a birth date and a, mar and a marriage and a death date and all this information, and he's a basket maker, and we're pretty much on our way to finding out what we needed to know. So moving back and forth with the searches and after adding the information that we find, that I find in each, in each movement, in each search, and, and re recall that I'm saying I searched many times in, in Ancestry and many times in Find My Past and many times in Family Search and many times in My Heritage because I kept adding information. Each time I added information, I found more information. So it wasn't a one-time look and say I'm done through because I checked that off on my, uh, my list. It's that I'm using these programs over and over again over a period of time. Um, so it helped clear up the issues and separate the people with the same name. Uh, now, there's still a little bit of an issue out there, you know, because I now know that there's two Williams out there because one of them I saw had a different wife's name. So there's another William Tarbot out there. But I'm pretty sure I've got the right guy because I, every, I mean, I got all these sources now. I mean, I've got a whole list of stuff here um, that I've picked up from all these programs. Um, and this could not been, have done, been done without using more than one website. I, I would be, after the first search on Family Search, I would be dead in the water because I didn't get any more information. I didn't have anything additional to add to that. Uh, the alternative would have been I could dig into Cranbrook 
uh, parish registers directly, look on uh, in the catalog, go to the parish registers and start looking at the, the digitized records or the microfilm records or start searching. Uh, but the only way that I'm going to be able to move forward in, in the process is to start spreading it out over a number of different websites. I'm not going to be able to just sit there and suppose that I've got the right information. Uh, too many people stop right there, and that's the problem, and that's why I go back through and do the research, even though somebody may have put in one date and maybe one source or something. But in this case, there were no sources, so I could assume that, that uh, whatever was there was not correct. But each of the websites added records and helped clarify the information. So I was switching back and forth, doing my searches over and over again in each of the programs, and then adding in the incremental information. It was also helpful to have my family tree in the programs because then I could use their automatic record sources. In this case, it didn't strike out. I struck out because the record source from Ancestry, none of them seemed to apply. At least that's what I supposed. Okay, so then what happened? Well, hmm. So I was getting, got interested because the guy was a basket maker. Now, why did I, I even think about that? Well, because being uh, having an occupation often helps you to separate out people. So I wanted to look and see if there was something else. So I did a Google search. I searched for William Tarbot as a basket, ma basket maker in Cranbrook. Um, what would you think? Well... What else did I learn when I did the search? Guess what? There's an entry for William Tarpin. And it, it tells he was born on the 18th of September in 1810th at Cranbrook to George Tarpin. And I went, oh, ooh, uh, oh, there is a, another one here. And so that's what happened. But if you're looking closely at this slide, you'll also see that I wrote about this in a blog post. So that's just where this was probably came, where all this information came from. But now, as we see that, I'm going, hmm, this is a problem. Let's see who this guy is. So he was a basket maker, and here's his biography online. William Tarbot, the son of George Tarbot, and he was uh, and does all this information about him being. Uh, fairly well known and very uh, involved in a lot of different organizations. And uh, he was born on 18th of September. Uh-oh, so now we have another problem because the guy that I've been looking at was born on, in December. And they're both in Cranbrook. And guess what? They both are basket makers. So we have two William Tarbots born a few months apart in a little town in England, and they're both basket makers. Hmm, so now what are we gonna do? So this additional information convinced me immediately that I had to go back and start all over again. I probably had the wrong William Talbot. Harbot. So here we go. So I'm gonna summarize here because this could go on all night, um, actually spent a tremendous amount of time, oh, well, tremendous, at least a day or two or three in hours and hours and one whole day looking through this information to come up with this. But after a lot of work of merging and researching and switching between programs and back and forth and doing more searches, uh, I found an awful lot about basket makers, and I found a whole lot about Cranbrook, and I found even more about the William Tarbots, and I found the right William Tarbot finally. And guess guess what? I found a William Tarbot born on 1st December 1810 and christened on the 13th of May of 1814. And who was he? He was also a basket maker, and he was the one that married to Elizabeth Griffiths. So this is the one that it ended up, but it took an entire day to sort out the two families. This wasn't a quick process, but it was going back and forth between all the programs and using all of these resources and the internet and Google searches and maps and everything else that allowed me to separate out who these two people were 
and then eventually find his, his family. So this is his family, uh, William Tarbett, and they have him down as Eliza, but is also short for Elizabeth, so that's not a, a very important difference there. But he was actually born on uh, in December and was then uh, christened a few years later with the rest of the members of his family at the same time. So this online research is essentially a process of going back and forth and back and forth. So there's no real uh, end to the process. And you have to understand that there's no finish line here. Uh, just because you have or you're oh, reasonably satisfied and you've done a reasonably exhaustive search of reasonable amount of information and you've found all these sources and you think that you've just got everything exactly correctly, it's always there's always question marks out there. There's always a problem. One more record can always begin the process all over again. And when I found that one record showing uh, the William Tarbett who was a uh, prominent citizen, I was guessing that that wasn't my guy. Um, and uh, so then I kept looking because then now we had two different birth dates, which showed me graphically that there were two different people. And then I had to do the additional research to make sure that I um, was choosing the right person. And um, so that's how we got to that point. So you're never entirely finished. You may think that you're finished. You may think you've got everything you've ever uh, thought about um, covered. But uh, uh, you know, once you get back into this earlier time, I have, I've qualified this a little bit. Um, you're never finished with people who are more recent because you can always add more historical information about them. You can always add more to their lives, find more photos, do more things that are helpful to make the person into a real person. But when you're working back in time like this, especially when you get back into the early, 17, in the early 1800s, into the 1700s, uh, you can never be completely 100% sure that you've got everybody correct. You've always got to keep adding as much as you can and doing researches. And uh, eventually, uh, eventually you get convinced yourself, but that doesn't mean that somebody like me won't come along and decide that you've done, all, done it all wrong and start over again. Okay, well, thanks for watching. Uh, are there any questions? So it looks like we have one question from Jan. She says, how do you keep multiple trees, family search, ancestry, my heritage, etc., in sync? Um, I don't even try to do that. Uh, I don't try to keep them in sync at all. I simply uh, keep the portions of the program updated as I uh, work on it. So, for example, if I'm in this case, when I started to work on uh, William Tarbett in, uh, in Ancestry, I just made sure that I had uh, the same information for the parents and, and family in there so that when I started searching, I was using the same information. That way, I, I kind of continually keep the programs up to date uh, as long as I'm working on them, but um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not necessarily uh, what is the new, what, I'm getting a message pops up here again. What is it saying? Um, Kathy it's Wells asked, uh, what is the new standard yeah, for dates it. and locations? Well, the standardized dates and locations vary between each of these programs. For example, in Family Search, the place all, always in all the programs, the places are listed from the smallest jurisdiction and the smallest place up to the largest. So from a farm up to a village, up to a city, up to a municipality, up to a um, district or state or province or whatever, and then up to the country. But in each of the programs have their own standardizing. And, and the biggest, uh, ob most obvious one, for example, in between Ancestry and Family Search is uh, Family Search is standardized on United States and Ancestry has standardized on USA. Um, so the dates, and the, it just depends on the program you're using as to which 
you know, which one is the one that they're using. So if you just check to see what their standard suggestions are, then that'll tell you what what they're looking for on that particular program. And I just kind of live with whatever their program says is standard. Any other questions going on? Oh, there's two more. How did you find uh, the Talbot's maiden name, and how did I know which one was yours? The reason I knew which one was mine was because of the christening date and the, the way that he fell in the christening date and his date of birth in December. And the christening date was the giveaway because the guy that had the wife whose name was Sarah Talbot, Tarbot was uh, um, basically uh, was the one that was born on a different date. That's when we started. And then, then when I investigated further, I found out that uh, uh, then I got then I found the other William Tarbot in, in census records, and that helped to differentiate between the two individuals. And I knew I had the right guy because he had a consistency of the, of the dates and places and things. And then the question on the maiden name uh, that just came up in a uh, in a record. Um, I can't remember if it was in a marriage record or whatever, but it just came right up. Any other questions out there? Out there, um. Sarah? It looks like a couple of people are typing in. Um, ben Bailey is just replying to your previous uh, comment on his question. He says, um, your investigation showed William marrying Sarah in 1849, and the children of William and Eliza didn't come along until uh, 1853. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they did. They got married at different times. So William, this was not a situation. I, the the census records, which I did not show all the census records, there were complete sets of census records for both families. So we're able to trace the both both families through the through the um, through all the census records eventually. So I had census records for for the William who married the Elizabeth or Eliza and the William who married Sarah. And the William who married Sarah, um, basically the, the biographical information that I found said that his parents were different than, um, than the ones that I already had in my, that I had traced down to in my ancestors that were my relatives. So I was looking for a William whose parents were um, that those parents, and I eventually determined that it couldn't be the one, so it had to be the other. It had to be the William who was married to Eliza, since he wasn't the one that was that was that didn't have the right parents. Anything else? Somebody's still typing away. Hmm? William would have been 43 when the first child, George, was born. Yeah. Um, comment by my wife who says that William would have been 43 when he was born, and the answer is that's not necessarily unusual. But it may presuppose that there is a, another wife before then. Um, oh, let me see if my... I don't have the list of the comments coming. Um, everybody is just saying so. thank you for your presentation. Oh, there we go. Let's try that. Um, I think we're ready to close up. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for your uh, patience and your participation today. Um, we have a couple of feedback questions that you can fill out on the left side of the screen. Um, and we'll have a webinar next Thursday. Uh, if you want to learn about how to make your own family history blog on Facebook, um, you'll hear from me and Simone Russell next week. Um, 